Well, welcome to this session. Um, yeah, really looking forward to sharing with you more of the, yeah, the awesomeness of the church and the, the wonder and the beauty of what God does in and through His body, which is the church. And just to remind us that um, as we've been learning in this quarter, it is the church, which is God's chosen vessel or vehicle through which He has deemed to reveal Himself to us to people, to people who are in need of a Savior and a Lord and a Redeemer. And it is the church which is also the vehicle. It is the people on the face of the earth that God has chosen to extend His kingdom through, which is, which is incredible, really, and which is so exciting, and which we as believers get to participate in and be part of and experience God working in us and through us. So I want to start um, this session with a pretty key scripture, which many of us will, will know well, and which is at the heart of Paul's letter that he wrote to the church in Ephesus. Re remembering that this letter that he wrote to the church in that region, in that city and in that region, was one of his, his keys in terms of revealing and teaching the truth of the mystery of the church, of God's chosen people. So we see in Ephesians 3 verse 10, that Paul writes that it is through the church that the manifold wisdom of God might be made manifest to the rulers and authorities in the way, in the heavenly places. Just one of my, my favorite portions of scriptures because I love the sense in which um, that God is multifaceted. He's, there's depth, there's length, there's breadth, there's height, there's there's mystery to him, but that mystery has been made known to us as well through the church. And this manifold wisdom, it's not just one bit of wisdom, not one, but that God owns all the wisdom on the face of the earth and it is his. And he has chosen to reveal it through us to see his, his kingdom extended upon the face of the earth as a witness, not just in this creation, but to the heavens as well, to the creations which are outside of our world that we live in. And so we see, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you a, a quote which is a favorite of mine with regard to the church, written by a, a well-known um, church leader and church growth guru, in a sense, Bill Hybels. And Bill Hybels said this with regard to the church. He said, nothing on earth, nothing on earth has greater potential to change lives and carry out his kingdom work in your community than the local church. There's nothing like the local church when it's working right. Its beauty, its beauty is indescribable. Its power is breathtaking. Its potential is unlimited. No other organization on earth is like the church Nothing even comes close. And I know those, I know those are just words written by a man, but you know, Bill Hybels, is, yeah, he's for many years has led an influential church in the United States who, though maybe they don't build exactly the same way as us, they have they've seen God do amazing things through them. And I think what he says about the, the weightiness, the magnitude, the the glory of God that rests upon the church is something should speak to us and inspire us about how God is wanting to use us in and through the church to see the kingdom of God extended. What a privilege it is. And while I might not um, agree 100% when um, Bill makes, he uses a word they call organization to, to speak of, of the body, or the church of Christ. Well, I might, I might not 100% you know, agree with them in the use of that word. It might be a little bit corporate in some ways. But what he says must not be discounted. It's an amazing truth. And when the church is working well, when the church is full of Jesus, when the church is full of the Spirit, when the church carries the heart of the Father, there is nothing like it upon the face of the earth. And so let's get excited for what God is wanting to do through us as his church here and now in the reality of our lives. And so over the course of the last few weeks, I know that we've been, um, been looking at kind of this, this understanding that it is the, the church that is responsible for stewarding the kingdom of God 
upon the face of the earth, that God has not chosen any big corporate business. He's not chosen some organization, but he's chosen a people, a people that he's called out as his known, that he has created as his church and his body. And it's to this people, it's to us, that he has said to us, you are now my stewards. You are now my ambassadors on the face of the earth. And it is our joy and it is our responsibility as we work with God to now extend his kingdom upon the face of the earth. And as I say that, we need to remember that in the Old Testament, one of the pictures that was building up over the course of the, you know, those, those years and all the different ways in which God was speaking in the Old Testament was this picture of the temple, that the temple was absolutely central to the life and to the worship of the Israelites and to the Jews over the course of their history. And now God says to us in the New Testament as believers in the here and now, He says, do you know what? You don't have to go to a temple. You don't have to go to a place. You are the temple. You are now the place where the kingdom of God is poured out upon the face of the earth. And so this just gets me amped, gets me absolutely excited about what God is wanting to do in us and through us. A portion of, scri a portion of Scripture which I I want us to, to think about and just dwell on for a moment is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, where again, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, his second, second letter to them, he says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. And because God is making his appeal through us, Paul says, I implore you, implore you as, as the people of God, be reconciled to him so that through you, a ministry of reconciliation can come to the world. And so isn't that amazing that God has chosen a people, God has chosen the church to be the group of people in the face of the earth who are his ambassadors to the nations and to the peoples of the earth. To be an ambassador is significant and it's important because it means that you are pointing beyond yourself. You are pointing to a greater reality. And that's what we as the church do. We, as, as much as people look at us as the church, as they look at us, we are the reflection of Christ to them. And we are pointing to them, to Him, pointing to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God is through us. God through us is pointing to the world and saying, look and see, see these people which are mine. They are the people on the face of the earth that carry the representation of who I am. Another portion of scripture which oh, is just awesome is uh, Psalm 34 verse 8. And I love the invitation that comes through this portion of scripture where the writer of the psalm says, if you can only taste if you can only taste of the goodness of God. And so as the body of Christ, as the church, we have something to offer to the world. We have the truth of who Jesus is, of his work in us, which we offer to them. To them. God seeing us as ambassadors towards the world. And as, as we speak to them, as we extend an invitation to them, God says we need to remember that as they come to us, we need to make sure that we are tasting, that we are we taste good, that we, we taste something of the richness of the kingdom, and therefore people are drawn to Christ and to the work that he is doing in his body. And so I know in a previous session that, uh, that we've looked at different pictures of the church, we've looked at different um, truths of what the church is, and we've, we've run through, through, uh, through many. And what I want to do today is I want to really focus on the truth or the fact that we as the body of Christ, are to be seen as exactly that, the church as the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 14 says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one baptism. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of the one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. And so if you, you think about this picture that, uh, that Paul is, is using as a metaphor to speak of the truth of the church 
Obviously, our bodies are not made up just of one part or one member, but made up of many. That the, that the finger, my finger, which carries my wedding ring here, is just as important in my body as any other part. Obviously, if someone was to, um, was to remove my head or to remove my brain, you'd have a problem. But, but this finger is just as important to my body as my toes or, or my arm or my heart. And this is why it's so important that we, we, get, we get an understanding here of the importance of the body and the interconnectedness of it and the functioning of it, remembering that Christ himself is the head, that Christ himself is the one through whom life flows from the head down through the body into the very extremities. In fact, Psalm 133 in the Old Testament says, that there is an anointing, there is a gracing of God, there's an anointing of the Holy Spirit that flows from the head Christ over, and then it speaks of the priests, or from his head all the way down over the, the garment, right to the very edge of the garment. And that for us is a picture that every member of the body, every person of the body, these, those of you here today, are valuable in the sight of God and that there are unique gifts and graces that the Holy Spirit, if He hasn't deposited in your life, will. He desires to, to see you come into more. Or if He has already, there's a grace and a gift He's deposited in you so that we together as the church can come into more and function together as, a, as this beautiful picture of God's body on the face of the earth who are stewards and ambassadors of the kingdom of God breaking forth. And so if that is the case, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 14, we see that there are different gifts within the body that are distributed to all within the church. All of the gifts distributed amongst the body. And as I say that, and as we see in Scripture, that's not to say that everyone gets all the gifts at the same time, but that God has connected us together as a body. He's called us together as this body because each member within the body plays a vitally, vitally important role. And so I come from a, a church background or a, 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 a different church theology where the understanding in that church background or in that church theology was that there was a priest and that priest or that man of God or that person who was gifted and graced by God was seen even from the members of the church to be, to be someone who, who played a primary role and, and in many ways did the work of many on the behalf of many. When we look at Scripture, we see the truth is that we as the body are all priests, that the Spirit of God has anointed each one of us to be priests and because we are priests, under Christ himself, as the new priesthood in the New Testament, we carry the gracing and the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit upon us and in us. And I want to tell us that that is good news. There is great, great joy in that. Being part of a church and being part of a New, a, a new Testament movement where we understand that each one is valuable, that each one is graced individually and uniquely by God for the extension of the kingdom of God upon the face of the earth. And so we see in Ephesians 4 verse 7 that Paul writes, again, this incredible letter in, uh, uh, that, that he wrote to the, the church in Ephesus. He writes in Ephesians 4 verse 7, he says, Grace was given, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. That grace was given not to a few, not to some, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. And as I touch on that scripture, I want us just to think about a diamond. I've had a friend who, who's worked in the diamond business for many years. One of his, his jobs was to get, um, to get uncut and unpolished diamonds which would come to him. And he sits behind a computer and he, through a mathematical system, looks at this rough diamond and works out what the best cut of that diamond is going to be. And then off it goes to those who cut it and polish it. And then it gets sent off to the companies like the Beers and others to be sold for lots of money. 
I love that picture because in many ways, God, God takes us as, as, as uncut, as rough diamonds, and he brings us into the church, and he brings us into the body, and he brings us into the family of the church, and he begins to work inside of us, and he looks at our lives, and he, he decides this is going to be the best cut for Ross, or this is going to be the best cut for whoever it might be in the body of Christ, and he finds a place for us to fit within the diamond, within a cut within that diamond. And if you take a diamond and you hold it up to light, if I was to do that today and hold a, a cut diamond up to light, what we would find is that light would shine through that diamond. And as it went through that diamond, there would be a refraction of light and a rainbow would come out on the other side. And God says in Scripture that he is the God of the rainbow, right? That he is the one who owns the colors of the rainbow. And I absolutely love that because it speaks of the fact that God himself, who is light, shines his light upon the body and within the body. And as his light shines into the body and through the body, it refracts out. And the glory of God, the beauty of the colors of the rainbow are seen through each unique person within the body. That's me, that's you, and that's each one of us. And so back to 1 Corinthians 12, and we're going to be spending a bit of time in 1 Corinthians, a bit of time in Ephesians, and a bit of time in Romans really today. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11 says this. It says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. It is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each individually as he wills. I just love this, that there are varieties of gifts, that there's not one gift, there's not a greater gift, but there are varieties of gifts and they all come from the same Spirit. They all come from Christ. They all come from the Father through this Holy Spirit who gifts these gifts into our lives as a deposit of what he is wanting to do as a gift to us that we are called to steward in him. Romans 12, 6 to 8, says something very similar. It says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. If that gift is prophecy, then you are to prophesy. If that gift is service, then you are to serve. If that gift is teaching, that you are to teach. It goes on, it speaks about encouragement and generosity and leadership and, and mercy. And as we look at those two portions of Scripture, particularly in 1 Corinthians 12 and, and, 1 Corinthians, I mean, and, and then in Romans 12, they, I don't believe, are meant to be an exhaustive list of the, of the giftings that God is wanting to deposit in the church, but they are to, they're, they're a guideline, they're an idea of what God is wanting to gift to us. And so in the life of the congregation or the church that I lead, as I read this portion of Scripture or these two portions of Scriptures, I am trusting and I am believing that within the congregation I lead that there is going to be every variety of the gift or the gracing of the Spirit of God that is poured out upon us. Every variety. Believing that, the God, that He is the God of all wisdom that we read about from the, that Scripture from Ephesians 3. Uh, three earlier, and that he is the God who, who owns every color of the rainbow, that he is the God who is creative in every part of who he is, and he's wanting to deposit those grace gifts into our lives to see the kingdom of God extended in and through the church. And so I want you to know that I, I personally don't believe that there are exhaustive lists, but they give us an idea of the the, the gifts of the Spirit that are going to be poured out upon the church in which we are to long and to hunger for and to ask God for. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In the Exodus 31 in the Old Testament, we read of a man by the name of um, Bezalel. And I love this. I love that God outside of the box, even in the Old Testament, just as we've been looking at a couple of New Testament portions of Scripture, in the Old Testament already, God was at work, at work by the Spirit and work in creative way, ways. And Bezalel says um, that the, the Spirit of God came upon him, that he was filled with the Spirit. And as the Spirit of God filled him, he was graced with ability and intelligence. And uh, 
that gives me great hope personally. That uh, if there's any of us who are needing greater measures of intelligence, God is going to potentially give it to us, or greater measures of ability, He's going to grace us with it. So the Spirit of God filled him, gave him ability and intelligence, and then it filled him, it says, with knowledge and craftsmanship to play a key artistic role in the designing and the building of the temple in the Old Testament. Now, if we just take that picture of the Old Testament and we copy and paste that into the New, I know in my congregation and the church I lead, I have got some extremely artistic, extremely gifted people in this way in my congregation. And that means that God has gifted them in that way. He's gifted that to them as a gift that they're both to steward it in the life of the church. But if that is a gift that they are going to steward and utilize in the world and outside of the, just the, the body of of the gathered church, that's exciting because it means that God is going to use them out there. He's going to use them out there in the world to see his kingdom come in power as they creatively point to him as the one who's gifted them and graced them in this particular way. And so in the New Testament, you see in a sense different, um, different categories of gifts which I'd like to mention to us and which I think are helpful. And if we look at those couple of lists, one in 1 Corinthians 12, the other in Romans 12, and there are a couple of other portions of Scripture that mention the giftings and the gracings in the, in the New Testament. One of them is Ephesians 4 that we'll get to in a moment. We see that uh, there are service gifts, that there are power gifts, that there are revelation gifts, and then there are what I call office gifts. And if we look at that portion of Scripture earlier from 1 Corinthians 12, and then from Romans 12, it speaks about the different varieties of gifts or the different gracings of gifts. Here's a helpful way for us of seeing the different ways in which those gifts are outworked within the life of the body. Remembering that we are one body, but with many parts. And so the service gifts might be, as we've seen already, gifts of mercy or gifts of hospitality, which... Um, are key gifts in the life of the church, so much so that those who are leaders or, or, or who are elders in the life of the church, this is a gift or a grace that we ourselves need to be walking in because it's a gift that builds bridges with others and allows others to get to know us and allows us to take people on a journey under Christ. And so we have service gifts like those gifts of hospitality or mercy and there are others which build bridges with others and allow the kingdom of God to work through us and reach into others' lives. And I know for me, those who have compassionate, mercy, service gifts are incredible in the life of the church because they are often the ones who are drawn, drawn to the ones on the outskirts of the body and they'll draw those who might be on, to, uh, on the outskirts more into the, the heart and the center of what Christ is doing in his church. And they also a gift outside of that on the streets and in workplaces just in the world, because they're the sort of people that's, that look for opportunities to reach out to others and to invite people into, into the, uh, the environment and the life of what God is doing in the church and trust that those people would meet Christ and come into an encounter with them. The power gifts, which often gets a real focus in the life of the church. And as I say that, I know some of you are smiling because you're desiring, either maybe you're walking in one, but you, you're longing and you desiring for one. We often do make much of them, but they are, they are significant gifts in the, in the body, and they are gifts like prophecy, like supernatural, miraculous, um, the ability to, to move in the miraculous, for, for people to be healed as you pray for them. Those sorts of gifts. It might be wisdom or discerning of the Spirit. They're, inc they're incredible gifts that, 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 are, that are gifts to us to see the kingdom of God extended through the church. So we've got service gifts, we've got power gifts, and then we've got revelation gifts. And that's more the, the prophetic type of gifts. And certainly within our movement, and we see this because of the New Testament and our desire to be grounded upon the New Testament, we desire to see each person, as we believe it was Paul's desire, as he was writing to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 14, and God's desire that that if there's one gift that we must desire, it is the gift of prophecy, this revelatory gift. Because as we move in this gift, it brings people potentially supernaturally into an encounter with the living God. Where God can move beyond the doubts of their mind, can move beyond the questions of their hearts, 
and speak personally into them that no other man or no other person could, but only God could in his supernatural ways because he knows every little thought and he knows every little movement and action inside each person's heart. And so seeing these different gifts is not for us to think that one gift is greater than the other, but to appreciate the different gifts within the body because we are one body with many parts. Intentionally, I haven't yet mentioned the office gifts. And in Ephesians 4, verse 11, which is obviously a, a key portion of Scripture in our movements of churches, it says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. And he gave these gifts to be able to serve the church, not just as grace gifts in, in particular moments, but he gives them really as offices. And when I say that, it means that there are individuals within our movement who are, they as people are gifts to us that upon their lives, they carry the, the office of either the apostolic or the prophetic or the evangelist. I'm just thinking for my particular congregation to have the, the office of an evangelist to come in and input into us even maybe I'm speaking prophetically at the moment, to something we need to have that office come into us and deposit something into us. It means that we're going to catch the heart of what it means to be an evangelist and to, to, to catch God's heart for the loss. And as we, as we invite that office and that person into our midst and receive their gift, we open our hearts up and we open ourselves up in the Spirit to receive the grace that they have been walking in so that we can walk in a greater measure, measure of that grace within the life of the body. And so the office gifts are foundational in nature to the church, absolutely foundational. In fact, in Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, it says that the, the apostolic and the prophetic are foundational, that Christ himself uses these gifts that the church is then going to be built Upon. It says in Ephesians 2, 19 to 20, that the household of God is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and that Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And that's the thing that God is wanting to dwell amongst us, and he does dwell amongst us as he deposits the graces of the Spirit into our lives and asks for, for us to graciously to receive those gifts and then to be able to walk in them and to steward them in order to see more of the kingdom of God coming upon the face of the earth. And so if that's the case, if, we, if looking at those portions of Scripture, we see the importance of the fact that we are one body, but with many parts, that we are one body with many gifts and and grace is poured out in our midst. What is the purpose? What is the purpose of these gifts within the church? Why has God given them to us? And we find one of the key answers in Ephesians 4 verse 12, which again is a key portion of Scripture in this movement of churches that we are part of. The reason that God has graced the church with gifts is so that each one of us would be equipped for works of ministry, so that each one of us would be built up in our faith within the body of Christ. Recognizing that each one of us had a moment where we were saved. We were taken from darkness, brought into light, and then we, the Holy Spirit came upon us. He baptizes us in His power, and as He baptizes us, He begins to apportion gifts of grace into us. And it is His desire as we even receive the different gifts and graces working in the body, that each one of us would grow up into a, a greater ability to walk in the joy of the gifts that God has given us. Romans 12 verse 6 is something very similar, recognizing that Paul wrote both these letters and is pulling the same thought through in different ways. Romans 12 verse 6, having gifts that differ, According to the grace given us, Paul then says, it's no use to recognize that you've got a gift. You've got to use it. Eh? And like I might have mentioned before, I've got two young kids. 
One is uh, heading towards five years old, and my son Evan is heading towards one and a half. And he's at that age at the moment where if you give him a gift, I gave him a guitar the other day. We gave him because he loves worship. He loves just in the life of the church. He just absolutely loves it. Gets to the front. He dances around with us and wants to be just like those guys standing there. So we gave him a guitar as a little, you know, one of those plastic guitars as a gift. And the poor guy gets this gift. And I've given it to him. And I'm just stoked to give it to him. But he's got no idea how to use it. Maybe a little bit premature. He's a youngster, you know. But the point is, who knows? Maybe God's got a spiritual gift there. Got a gift in gracing and worship, which he's going to receive. And if he does receive it, which I hope and pray that he does, my hope is that he would steward that gift, that he would use the gift. And even as a young man, he'd look for opportunities to get stuck in and to serve Christ's church and to grow in the, the gifting that he himself has been equipped with. But you know, as I say this, um, one of the things which is a, is a real reality in the life of the church is we, we can look at the person next to us, you know, and we can look and go, but God, I haven't received the gift that they've received. They, they, they've received the power gift, or they've received the revelatory gift, or they've received an office gift, and I've only received a serving gift. And unfortunately, that's a reality in the, in the life of the church, and we can think this in our minds, or we can even think it in our hearts, not necessarily telling anyone but that can create a disunity. It can create a dis discord within the, our, the oneness of the body of Christ. And, and Paul knew this. And Paul saw this in the life of the churches that he was serving and he was leading and he was planting. And he addresses this in, in different portions of Scripture. And I want to touch on what he says in, in Romans 12, um, 3 to 5, where he says, For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And so somehow Paul, in his apostolic gifting, and in his office as an apostolic gift to the church, incredible man with an incredible gift, was able to hold in tension this thing that on the one hand we are one body, but on the other hand we are many parts. And wherever he, meant, he went, he would remind the church of this reality, would say to them, we are one body, we are one people, but in the midst of that, God has poured out many gracings, many graces, many gifts, and he's asking each one of us to steward those gifts, but as we are to steward those gifts, we are to make sure that there is nothing that grows up inside of us, that either fills us with pride and makes us think that we are better than the person next to us, or grows up inside of us and makes us think that we are less than the person next to us. And so in this portion of Scripture, and in other portions of Scripture, like 1 Corinthians 12, Paul addresses these things, and he asks and he teaches into the truth that we would accept the reality that we are one body with many parts, and the key way in which we are to steward and to step out in faith in the gift and the gracing that God has given us is with humility all the time. And I think, you know, this is the, one of the things that I, I love about leading a church and the privilege that it is to serve the church, the body of Christ, is every time I come together with a person, it's my heart's intent, I pray, and I pray it is, or each time we, we gather together as the body, to see each person around me or next to me or whoever comes into interconnectedness with me to come into more to see them come into more in God and for us to each serve each other so that we can each come into a greater measure of joy in the gifting and the gracing that God has given us and to, to steward the gifts that God has given us, believing that God wants each one of us to come into more. And so I want to touch on this unity thing a little bit more and the importance of it. In order... Now, the reason that 
The purpose, the gifts that, the, that I've just been touching, the purpose of the gifts within the church, as I've just been mentioning, is that each one of us would come into a unity, a maturity, and a fullness in Christ. And so back to Ephesians 4, verse 13. We've looked at verse 11 where he speaks about the different offices, the different grace gifts, which are offices in the life of the church. And Paul then went on and he spoke about in verse 12 that the heart of those offices and those gifts is to equip the saints for the works of ministry. He goes on in verse 13 then of Ephesians 4, and he says, until we all attain to what? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I want to say that that's God's intent in the church is that as there's unity upon us, he calls us to unity. We are one body with many parts. But as we are unified in him, one Psalm, Psalm 133 says that there's a gracing, there's an anointing that comes where there is unity. And Paul's getting at this. He says, well, there's a unity of faith. There's going to be an anointing and a gracing of the Spirit. And where there's an anointing, there's a gracing of that Spirit. And there's a love, there's a genuine love for one another. And there's not a rivalry there's not a thinking of a more of myself or a less of myself for the person next to me. We're going to become into a greater maturity. And as we come into a greater maturity, we are going to come into a greater fullness. And how I long for myself and how I long for all of the church and for all of us to come into the more of the fullness of Christ in us. And so having said these things, having having brought these realities to us of the, the beauty of the oneness of the body, but also the many parts, the many grace gifts in the midst of us. What should our response be? And I want to leave a few responses with us today. And I want to say, if this is the case, we need to be seeking the giver. We need to be seeking him. We need to be trusting that as we do seek him and we spend yeah, we spend time with him. And more than spending time with him, we touch his heart. As we touch his heart, I don't know when my little boy or when my kids touch my heart, when there's something that they do which just touches me, I, wanna, I just want to love on them. And as I love on them, there's always something I want to give them. There's something I want to bless them with. It's God's heart to do the same. That we just seek him. And then as we seek him, we need to believe that he's going to gift us and he's going to grace us with these gifts. And that we're therefore to receive them, to receive his gifts of grace, but it's not enough just to receive them. Having received them, he then asks us to steward them and to grow in the gifting that God has given us. And sometimes that means you're going to go through some difficult stuff because it's often through conflict or it's often through some, um, some things that God will reveal in, in us that we've got to process before we can more fully walk in the fullness. But that's a good thing. And that's his grace even to us. So we are to receive, seek, to receive, and we are to use. And then to reiterate that we're only going to walk in more of that fullness and come into more of that fullness if we humble ourselves and if we remain expectantly believing. You know what I believe? I believe, I really do, that if we, if we position ourselves with that posture of humility that Romans 12 was just speaking into and speaking to us about, that God will graciously and generously bless us with all the varieties of the gifts, with every manner of gifts that speak of the creativ creativity of the eternal God and of who he is and allows us as the body of Christ, therefore to usher in the kingdom in supernatural ways, in powerful ways, in loving ways, but in ways of serving and of giving ourselves to Christ in greater measures. And so as I land the session, I want to bring to us a portion of Scripture which just blows me away. We're in John 14. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, and you have to believe, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these he will do because I am going to the Father. And you know those greater works there? For me, for me that speaks of unity of maturity and of fullness. And I believe that when the church, the church now being the body of Christ, us as individuals called and grafted into that body, each unique, each graced, as we each 
walk in more unity, greater maturity, we are going to come into a measure of fullness, which means the church itself is going to do greater works than Christ himself was able to do upon the face of the earth. That is only going to be possible, people, if we walk each one of us in our gifts and in our gracings, and if we steward that, trusting that God's going to bring us into a greater maturity. And as we do a greater fullness, the trickles of our lives, each one of us is going to become a stream. And as the streams of our lives come together, it's going to come together like a river. And I believe that that river is going to flow through us as churches and through us as movements to see the kingdom of God extended in such a way that people will look at us and go, you know what? You as a people are doing greater works than even Christ himself was doing upon the face of the earth. Let me pray for you. Father, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for the truth of your word. And I want to pray that as you, as you speak to us today, and as you reveal to us, and as you encourage us with the gifts that you've already gifted us, I want to pray that you'd pour out upon us as, a, as churches and as a movement a greater measure of, of your gifting God that we would see more service gifts, we would see more power gifts, we would see more revelation gifts, we would see more office gifts poured out, all the variety of the gifts poured out upon us as a movement so that, Father, we can come into more to see more churches planted, to see more people saved, and to see the kingdom of God extended across the nations of the earth.